Imagine waking up in the morning to the pale rose light of dawn. With each passing minute, the glow deepens into a vibrant magenta, illuminating the swaying tips of prairie grasses. Barefoot and free, you take a deep inhale and catch the scent of coffee already simmering on the camp cook's fire. As each gulp of the strong black coffee warms you, you feel the strength and uncontainable energy begin to hum through your veins as your body fortifies itself up for a long, satisfying day of good hard work in the sun. If you were a pioneer, 49er, or a cowboy during the mid-1860s, you didn't have to imagine because campfire coffee was a common reality of life on the prairie. It was a staple that few could do without. I hope you've gathered some firewood because we're going to need a fire as vibrant and wild as this chapter of American heritage for today's beverage, campfire coffee. In its simplest form, coffee is a decoction. Decoction is a method of extraction in which a plant, herb, or root, coffee in this case, is ground or mashed and then boiled to allow its natural chemicals to dissolve into the water, infusing it with flavor and beneficial nutritive properties. Following the American Revolution, tea was seen as a symbol of British oppression and patriots such as John Adams eschewed it. Not to mention the incredibly high taxes on tea only grew as the years went by. Coffee was not only a way to escape that tea tax, but also began to be seen as the perfect strong and bitter drink for any hardy, hard-working American. Popular culture came to associate tea with being weak and wimpy, and coffee with being tough and honest. As such, coffee grew in preference following the revolution until it really boomed after the War of 1812 quickly becoming a household commodity. Let's see for ourselves what the fuss is all about. To begin, ready your setup. You'll need a nice, cheerful fire made of logs or charcoal. I found this fire starter log made of recycled coffee grounds, which is perfect for today's video. And let me just say, it smells amazing. Suspend a pot over the campfire or on a wire rack positioned on top of a ring around your fire pit like mine. Don't forget a lid, stirring utensil, and a mug. Bring eight ounces per serving of water to boil over a fire. I'm using the mug to measure my water because I will be using that same mug to drink the coffee. And I'm doubling the portions to make coffee for two people. Oh, and please do not use water you gather from lakes and streams. While waiting for the water to boil, grind your beans coarsely. Don't tell the pioneers, but I went ahead and ground mine at home before I headed to the campsite. You will be able to tell your water is boiling when you see big rolling bubbles on the surface. Once it is boiling, bank the fire to low coals or move your pot further from the fire. Now add 16 grams of coffee per eight ounces of water. If you don't have a way to weigh it, then that's about two tablespoons of grounds. Give it a good stir to wet all the floating grounds. Now, hear me out, throw in some broken eggshells. Yes, you heard that correctly. Why in the wild west are we adding eggshells to coffee? For two reasons, actually. The chemical reactions of the alkaline shells with the coffee will reduce the overly acidic taste that this method of coffee making tends to produce. And the eggshells help the loose coffee to settle to the bottom of the pot which makes it easier to serve when it's finished brewing. Cover it and let your coffee brew for 15 minutes. That gives us just enough time to take a look at what it meant to be a frontiersman in the American West. Life on the plains was arduous but rewarding. Out there, pioneers, homesteaders, and cowboys were constantly exposed to the elements, even having to deal with natural disasters like twisters and prairie fires. Cowboys rode hard all day roping longhorns, fighting the sheer strength and will of the enormous animals. Homesteaders did not have it easy either. They had to build their homes by hand, maintain crops and livestock, and all manner of backbreaking labor. It's no wonder that frontiersmen and women relied so heavily on the revitalizing spark of coffee. Coffee was consumed with every meal, and sometimes in between meals. It was not uncommon to average about five cups of strong black coffee a day. 
It was best summed up by Cavalry Lieutenant William H. C. Whiting when he said, Give the frontiersman coffee and tobacco, and he will endure any privation or suffer any hardship. Coffee beans were used in barter for furs to the tribes of the plains. Often skirmishes broke out between the two groups due to disagreements on the fairness of the trade. Just goes to show that coffee was considered so valuable on the American plains that it sometimes came down to fisticuffs to make sure everyone was getting their coffee. Before the Civil War era, pioneers had to drink mock coffee made with some combination of rye, parched corn, bran, and okra seeds because coffee was expensive and hard to find on the frontier. Man, that's real coffee. It ain't chicory and dirt. If a pioneer were blessed enough to find themselves in possession of coffee beans, those beans were still green, and the pioneer would have to be the one to roast and ground the beans. The green coffee beans had to be roasted by hand in a shallow pan over a fire or cook stove, or a long-handled roaster on the hearth. The taste would often come out burned and bitter. After that, a very coarse grind was achieved by grinding the roasted beans by hand in a mortar and pestle, or by using an old-fashioned grinder. Or, if you were a Civil War cavalryman, you use the butt of your sharps carbine to grind your coffee. After 1864, coffee roasting, grinding, and mass packaging became much more accessible, as more industrial machinery was patented. Now, instead of having to roast and grind their own beans, pioneers carried sacks of pre-prepared coffee, labeled with names like Pioneer Steam Coffee and Spice Mill, J.A. Folgers & Company, and Arbuckles. Our buckles came with a stick of candy in the bag, and cowboys fought over who would be the one to brew up the batch and therefore earn the stick of candy for himself. Of course, there's the 19th century industrial way of making coffee, and then there's how the chuck wagon makes it. According to an American cowboy, take one pound of coffee, wet it good, boil it over a fire, pitch in a horseshoe, and if it sinks, put in some more coffee. No wonder cowboys were known for their extremely strong coffee. Often the grounds were left in the pot after each brew, and new grounds were added day by day. When it reached the top of the pot, it was time to clean it out and start new. Now that our coffee has finished brewing, let us join the ranks of those rustic fireside tasters. First, add a bit of cold water over top of the coffee to force the grounds to sink to the bottom of the pot. Here you will see me adding eggshells to the pot much later than I was supposed to because my overconfident brain decided to try to do the recipe from memory and clearly failed. Now cowboys used their mugs to scoop the coffee directly from the pot. In a pot with many more servings of coffee in it, this would be okay to do, but in my pot of coffee for two, no matter how careful I am, using my mug was a risky choice as I came close to stirring up the settled coffee grounds. I recommend bringing along a ladle or dipper to make serving easier and less messy. It actually smells chocolatey and a little bit caramelly. Cowboys like their coffee barefooted or black. If they sweetened it at all, they would sweeten it with molasses, called lick or long sweetening, which is impossible for me to say without a cowgirl accent. But before we add molasses, let's take a taste of our coffee in its natural state. This is surprisingly great. I expected it to be extremely strong and bitter, maybe even too acidic, but I could actually taste some chocolatey notes and a slight edge of pine. This is nice and earthy. Let's go ahead and sweeten it. I won't be adding milk though. Cowboys thought that if they took milk in their coffee, their breath would smell like a nursing calf's and the cows would not respect them. Not to mention nobody wanted to milk a cow and therefore add another chore to their already long list. Okay, wow, this is awful. I don't like this at all now that we've added molasses. It definitely tastes rustic, but the molasses has made this coffee way too tangy with some kind of sickly sweetness. Well, I guess it's as cowboys say, good judgment comes from experience and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. As you continue to sip your coffee, 
I hope it enfolds you with warmth and vigor, perhaps renewing your motivation and productivity, or giving you a lively spirit of strength to conquer your day ahead. As the flames of your cooking fire dance playfully, take a moment to remember these wise words from a well-loved pioneer, Laura Ingalls Wilder. It's the simple things of life that make living worthwhile. The sweet, fundamental things such as love and duty, work and rest, and living close to nature. If today's cup of coffee was just the encouragement you needed, please give this video a like. I would love to hear about your favorite campfire memories or your best campfire stories, so I encourage you to tell your tale in the comments section of this video. Thank you for sharing this time together around the fire today. Next time we are together will be in the new year, which I think is the perfect time to make a warm yet revitalizing London fog with its characteristic notes of citrus and vanilla. Subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss the festivities. Thanks again, and I will see you next episode on Steam Pour. If a pioneer were blessed enough to find themselves in possession of green beans... Oh. <laughs> green beans. <laughs>